Hello and welcome to episode 63 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and this is a gardening podcast. We have come together to talk to you about plants and flower beds and the things that are found within them, mainly weeds this week. I'm talking about oxalis and Welsh poppy and great willow herb which together form from quite a triumvirate and actually would make quite a nice planting for, for a pot. You've got creeping wood sorrel to, to form the, the flowing bit. You have the Welsh poppy to do its mid-height flowering and then maybe a, a shabby spire of great willow herb to, to stand tall in the centre of the pot. There is a suggestion for anyone looking for a derelict waste ground chic there is no room for waste ground in my garden, unfortunately, so I was pulling them out and putting them into the compost heap. This week I am also talking about electric hedge trimmers, something for the gadget fans among you, and I am talking about a fantastic rose, one that I have growing up a poplar at the bottom of the garden, and which will one day swallow that tree almost entirely, and probably pull it crashing to the ground. But that's why I planted it. A huge amount of horticultural stuff to get through, I'm sure you will agree. So time to leave all of these introductions behind and listen to The Week in Gardening. Hello and welcome to the week in gardening. The week began when I received an intelligence report early on Monday morning that there had been numerous weeds sighted in the rockeries. It was left up to me to decide what to do with this information. Tack was probably the best form of defence and so I spent Monday nerdling around with a carving knife, getting into all of those crevices and cracks between the blocks of stone and taking out those reported weeds. It turns out there were mostly Welsh poppies, and Welsh poppies sit on that strange borderland between weed and flower, where everything is subjective and it's all about position and place. I personally tend to err on the side of flower, for, for most things, because I am lazy and also because I like that that merged together, everything blending look for the rockeries. But that's not what we're going for. We're going for almost a display, that more old fashioned, but, but still very legitimate look where the alpine plants are given the opportunity to form perfectly presented little cushions on their own without being threatened by big leaved orange flowered poppy cultivars. So I went to work with the carving knife. They are very hard to get out, the Welsh poppy. It forms a taproot. It's a perennial poppy. And it forms this this taproot like a little etiolated parsnip. And I think if you were a botanist coming to the garden for the first time, and you'd never seen a Welsh poppy before in your life, you would write down in your little notebook that, that Welsh poppy seeds can only germinate when they are in contact with a very large rock. Because our ones seem to exclusively grow where they can wheedle their root down into those cracks and crevices and provide themselves with the greatest chance of re-sprouting from a little bit of root left into the ground. Anyway, I went round with the, the blunt carving knife. What you want is, is one of those cheap carving knives made of stainless steel which very quickly lose their edge but have quite a fat blade and that you can use for years to, to shove down into bits and pieces behind stones. You don't want to use the best finest carbon steel knife because you'll be wasting your time. And so that was Monday in the main part. The worst poppies in the rockery tend to be an orange strain. 
We have Welsh poppies in the woodland as well, which are more yellow. I love Welsh poppies for shade. You don't think of the poppy as a shade-loving plant. You think of it as a plant of the baked cornfield. But actually, they do quite well in the shade. They don't flower as prolifically as out in the sunshine. But on the edge of a woodland, they will throw up two or three flowers at once and keep doing it for months on end. They're a worthwhile plant to have there. On Tuesday, I put the knife away and got out the hedge trimmers once more. Though this was a day of celebration, for we have finally ditched those horrible fume-belching petrol trimmers. This was the first day of working with our new battery-powered, wonderfully quiet, fumeless tools. The energy just comes from a power station rather than a tiny little motor burning two-stroke right under my nose. But God, I am glad that that is far away from me. There's nothing worse than a whole day spent hedge trimming in the heat where the exhaust fumes almost pump themselves into the hedge so the whole thing leaks noxious smoke on you and contributes to the to the headache that you get from, from wielding these noisy, clacking, rackety things anyway. The the electric ones we've got, we've got one of the, the single bladed, that is, that cuts on one side, handheld ones, and one of the incredibly long pole jobs, which goes right right out on a massively telescopic arm. Because they are so light, they're wonderfully easy to carry around, but the very, very, very long ones almost lack the balancing weight of that huge engine on the end. So when you are using it extended to, say, 12 foot, the weight of the battery isn't quite enough to, to keep it stable. So you have to use quite a lot of forearm strength. That's the only criticism I could possibly have for these things. I don't think we will do anything this year to, to single-handedly make the life of the gardener better than transferring over to these things. We've also got a battery-powered chainsaw now, and we're going to pick up a battery-powered strimmer. This is the world of science fiction. I remember hearing about the battery tools when I was getting into gardening. And I remember hearing about all the French stuff they were using out on the vineyards. Those wonderfully mechanically assisted secateurs that look like something from, from an alien movie with the, with the cable that runs along the arm of the grower and then they, they chop them. And I didn't realise how quickly they would come onto the market. Our tree surgeons now only use electric saws, it seems. I think they might occasionally to go for a petrol one if they're taking down the, the actual trunk of a tree, but all of their aerial work, all of the limbs that they tie to rope and swing down from the canopy, all of those are done purely by batteries now. It's amazing how things change. I can't wait until there is no petrol in the garage at all, until the lawn mowers, the leaf blowers and everything are driven by these, these wonderful battery-powered machines. That sounds like a bit of a boast, but it's not just me who feels the benefit. It's everyone who comes near an engine in any capacity. No longer do you hear that combustion. You just hear the, the whir of the blades or the whoosh of the air that comes from the blower. And that is a great change. I won't bother describing the, the actions of the day itself. If you listened to last week's episode, then you will have heard about hedge cutting and if you didn't listen to it, well, it's, it's there in the catalogue. I suggest you do a little bit of time travelling back to a week in early July 2019. On Wednesday, I returned to the carving knife and my weed nerdling. It was a very hot, humid and sticky day. One of those days where the air doesn't seem to have enough air in it. And I spent my time battling Oxalis this time round. I was, I was going for Oxalis corniculata, which is the, the native wood sorrel with the tiny, tiny little trilobed leaves and those gorgeous little yellow flowers. There's two forms that, that you generally find over here, the green leaf form and the purple leaf form. And I was dealing with the purple leaf form. It spreads on runners that erupt from, from various places. And it's, it's quite satisfying. It's quite good and easy to, to get out. It's one of these plants that tends to grow through other plants. But if you find the, the centre of it and get your knife tip under there, you can pull it out and get out these long spaghetti strands. And you feel a certain visceral satisfaction, like you're a blackbird inching a, a worm from the ground. 
The other type of oxalis is the more frustrating type of oxalis, that, that introduced form, the oxalis debilis, which has pink flowers, it's slightly larger, has pink flowers, quite nice, uh, long-stemmed pink flowers that flop about the place, but it's very invasive and it spreads by these horrendous little bulblets that, that go everywhere. It's very hard to get them all out. The bulblets tend to surround a, a big translucent fat taproot on an old plant, and the bulblets go popping off in, in various different directions. It obviously spreads by, by seed as well. I was, I was getting both of those out, and it's a fiddly old job. You can spend a whole morning working on these tiny little plants and fill half a wheelbarrow, and you look back, almost head in hand, and say, all that for this? But it makes a difference to the area that is being cleared, so one can't complain too much. On Thursday, I was off trying to put things in order for the, the looming dissertation. I will not trouble you with my troubles in that particular area. On Friday, I came back and I did some more weeding. It's a very weeding heavy week this week, which I think is probably a good sign. It means that the season is under control. We are not rushing around replacing things that have failed. We are not tending to, to midsummer bare spots because we have managed to get things in their place, things flowering where they should be. We are not still staking and trying to save things that have fallen over where they shouldn't have fallen over. A lot of our plants have fallen over, but this year that's, that's almost a feature. It's the drunken garden. It looks slightly sideways. I really enjoy this, this time of year for the fragrance. It's the smell of the lime tree which particularly affects me, particularly cycling through London. It's so nice to, to get that huge waft of sweetness, that overwhelming lime treeness, and know they're around somewhere, and often you can't see them. It's strange, the scent seems to get taken over roads of houses and dumped into a side street, as if all the smells had been hit by, by a tornado and then left elsewhere, and you have your neighbour's smell lying upside down in your garden. I like to get this, this whiff of the lime tree and then, and then search it out, see in the local streets where it might be coming from, and invariably do find a row or a clump of those magnificent trees. The other tree that I enjoy at the moment is the sweet chestnut, which is an incredible flower at the moment. The whole thing almost looks variegated because it has those long explosions of catkin-like flowers, but they're not, they're not catkins because they don't hang down. They are, they are golden strands, and each one of them is about the length of the, the sweet chestnut leaf. And so they, they almost line up, and it looks like every leaf is striped with, with gold from stem to tip. I was weeding under the shade of various trees, and on Friday I was weeding a much bigger weed, a, a giant in the weed world, one of those weeds that seems to spring from nowhere. And you, you look at a flower bed and scan your eyes across it on Wednesday and think, my kingdom is in order, no one gives me trouble. And then on Friday, these, these annoying robber barons have poked their heads above the canopy and are shouting at their gardener king in open rebellion. So I went off and quelled some of that rebellion. It was great willow herb that I was taking out. And great willow herb seems to grow about a foot a day when it's happy. It's often mistaken for rose bay willow herb. Gardeners will see it and say, well, you've got rose bay willow herb coming up there. I think that's because rose bay willow herb is just a nice word to say, rose bay willow herb. And great willow herb, despite obviously being great, doesn't have that, that same poetry. It's also true that, that rose bay willow herb is a much more attractive weed. Sometimes you think, why would anyone bother to, to plant a garden when they could just have a stand of rose bay willow herb with those magnificent pink spires? And they really do, they do look like spires. They look like something that might top a, a floral cathedral, perfectly, perfectly symmetrical and opening from the bottom up. Whereas great willow herb is, is altogether more shabby. It gets up to a similar height. It gets to that, to that wonderful 
1.2 meters or so, but it is altogether more shambolic. If the Rose Bay Willow Herb is like a cathedral, then the Great Willow Herb is like a sort of ramshackle watchtower that someone has illegally built on the top of a, a falling down turret of a castle they don't even own. It flowers in, in sporadic little clumps along with little leaflets and the flowers don't all come out at once. Some of them are very long in bud, in an almost ribbon-like bud. Some of them are opening, some of them are spent and starting to split into seed pods. But they're, they're pleasant, they're pleasant plants to pull up because it only takes three of them and then you have as much vegetable matter as you as you rested from the ground in all day spent hunting oxalis. So I quite like it for a Friday job when one wants to feel satisfied and see a, a great mound of leaves piled onto the compost heap. It's also a good plant to leave hanging around if you've got the space for it and your job does not depend on having a, a garden that is clear of weeds, then it's worth leaving a good stand of it because it's the food plant for the elephant hawk moth, a caterpillar of which I've never seen in our garden. But when you do see them, they are a sight not quickly forgotten. Maybe you vast agrarian landowners out there could do a little bit of a great willow herb cultivation. I'm recording this from a pretty agrarian area. You might notice a difference in the sound in this recording. I'm not in my, my small green walled study. I am in an ancient chateau, Chateau Mondésir, on the, the edge of the Dordogne in southwest France. And around here, the, the harvest is slightly advanced. They have already cut down the wheat and the drying stems are lying on the fields waiting to be baled. But there are a few fields that, that retain the crop waiting for their tardy, drunken farmer who yet again has left his crop too late. And in those fields you see wonderful sunflowers poking above the, the golden ears. And they, they stand there looking completely, completely shameless, comic and incongruous. I think they look like emus standing in the middle of a penguin colony. There is the, there is the absurd about them. And you get a bit of that with the with the great willow herbs when they shoot through a fairly neat canopy of flowering hardy geraniums or, or Valcamilla mollis, and they're just standing there, sort of saying, "What me? I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about." Um, as you come over and, and yoink them out, you always want to say, "Be a bit more subtle." If you'd been subtle and you'd done your business down there, then you could have set seed and it would all have been fine. But you had to go up. You had to grow so tall. So anyway, I did that, and with that done, it was the end of my week in gardening, and I set off for home, and thence for foreign climes. So next week. I will not be recording a week in the garden. I don't know if I will do a podcast. I might do one that, that is based around maybe maybe the plants of this region down here in France. Or, or maybe we will just have a, a break from, from the garden log. Anyway, let's get on and see if I have any recommendations this week. My recommendation this week takes the form of a plant. It is time for another of my short essays on plants I have known and worked with. This week I am talking about one of the infamous plants, one of the plants that has a place in, in modern gardening lore. I'm talking about a rambling rose. I'm talking about the very famous, much celebrated and equally maligned rambling rector. So, if you are sitting comfortably. Rambling roses are not repeat bloomers, and that is not a criticism. A constant need to impress is a symptom of insecurity, and as Auden wrote, never to be dull shows a lack of taste. Rambling Rector has class enough to spend summers as a mass of leaf and thorn, coasting on the scented fumes of two glorious weeks in June. We will get to those weeks presently, 
but first that mass and those thorns. Rampaging Rector might be a truer name. Throughout his quarter century at the helm of Gardner's question time, Eric Robson scattered updates on the trees his had swallowed, seven at the last count. The rector's speciality is snaring orchards, pulling them to the ground and lurking over the corpse. It is behaviourally and literally a bastard rose, most likely a cross between Rosa Moschata, the musk rose, from whence it gets its perfume, and Rosa Multiflora, from where it gets its ability to pin down whole mountainsides. Many believe that rambling roses grow from the base, like brambles, shooting out fresh whips each year. But in fact they grow from anywhere, forming wrist-thick trunks and breaking from old wood. Fresh growth on a rambling rector is beautiful. The two-metre stems are apple green and the thorns are blood red. Both fade in their second year and beyond, making pruning a fairly easy job. After flowering, the first year growth with those rubescent barbs should be tied in. They will carry next year's flowers. And the slightly faded wood with its spent blooms should be removed, unless the, the little autumn hips are desired. An occasional rejuvenating decapitation is helpful. The rector is indestructible and it will see the insult as encouragement. The rambler's flowers are white and semi-double. They're held in large clusters, fifty or more to a foot of bloom. A ripe stem on an established plant might send out a dozen of these clusters. A rose in full show with fifty such tendrils is unignorable, and those who fear white need not worry. Each flower's yellow centre butters away the glare and lends a warm beauty to whatever the rose drapes over. When a rambling rector is planted, PVC-coated arches become classy, and sheds wear fabulous veils, and men fall in love with otherwise unremarkable outbuildings. Let the rose romp from tree stumps to conifer hedges, turning semi-rural plant dross into magazine covers. This is neglect made to appear intentional, the best look in town. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of The Garden Log, recorded here in Chateau Mondesir. I have been your host, Ben Dark. I'd like to say a particular thank you to those of you who have left me reviews. I got a very nice one this week from Miss Janie over in Australia. I think that might be my first Australian review. And she said lots of very nice things about the podcast, for which I am very grateful. Thank you very much, Miss Janie. If you would like to leave a review, you can do so on on all of those places that, that you are listening to this right now. Next week, there will almost certainly be a podcast of some sort. I'm yet to work out the format. I won't have done any gardening, though I will have done a lot of looking at plants. So, so we might get some, some observations on the, the plants of this particular region. It'll probably be quite short, but, but I'm sure worth listening to nonetheless. Until then, I, I thank you very, very much. And I hope you have a wonderful time, whether you are in the garden or on holiday or just sitting in the shade thinking about things. Au revoir.